Hello, everyone. In today's episode, the book we'll be talking about is titled Healthy Teachers, Happy Classrooms, 12 Brain-Based Principles to Avoid Burnout, Increase Optimism, and Support Physical Well-Being. The book delivers a breakdown of these principles that include action plans and other valuable information, which we'll get into in this episode. We are joined by the author of this book, Marsha Tate. She has 48 years of experience in education. Her career started as a classroom teacher. She is the author of 12 books, with the most recent one being Healthy Teachers, Happy Classrooms. Marsha also continues to teach students and was just in a classroom in New York three weeks ago. Marsha, thank you so much for joining me for this episode. Thank you very much for having me. I was so excited. Uh, um, I remember uh, we just did your webinar. I was actively going through um, the activities that you were having us be engaged in. It was just so rewarding because I felt more energized after that. (laughs) Wonderful. Well, if teachers would teach this way, then students will feel more energized as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I agree. Um, All right. So now you have a great uh, career track from being a former executive director of professional development, classroom teacher, reading specialist, uh, language arts coordinator, and staff development executive director. Um, Can you elaborate on which part of your experience inspired you uh, to author all of these books, but then also specifically this book that just came out? Certainly. I've never had a job in my career that I didn't love. I actually have loved every one that I've had. But I think the one that inspired me to become a consultant and writer was the one uh, as language arts coordinator, because it was my job to make sure that every teacher in our district uh, had the skills necessary to teach language arts. And so I had to do workshops for adults. And that was the first time I had ever done a workshop for an adult audience. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And then uh, when I went to the staff development department in our school district, we began to teach classes on the brain. I spent a week with Eric Jensen, who at the time was a top presenter on the brain. And I left thinking every teacher needs this information. So we came back and we put together classes so that we could teach our teachers in the district about the brain and how the brain learned. And then I took that brain research. I was teaching classes on learning style theory, Howard Gardner's theory, multiple intelligences, and realized that there were 20 ways to teach the human brain. And it didn't matter what subject you were teaching or what grade level. And so that was my introduction into my first book that I wrote, which is on those 20 strategies that should be used to teach the brain. Mm-hmm. Nice. That's that's wonderful. That's very thorough. Very thorough. Um, all right. So in a previous conversation that we had, you mentioned that one of your daughters is a school principal. So what are some of the things she shares with you that teachers she works with are going through? I'm so proud of her because she started as a classroom teacher also and was an instructional coach, assistant principal, and now is a principal. And we were talking the other day and she was telling me that many of her teachers uh, are going through trying to close the gaps that have happened with students as we have lost instructional time through the virtual versus the in-person. For instance, you've got second graders who were in kindergarten when the uh, pandemic hit. And those second graders are expected to master second grade skills, but the teachers are seeing that they haven't mastered some of those skills that they should have gotten in first grade. And so it's teachers having to fill up those gaps. And then they're noticing too, that because students have been taught virtually that they've lost or they didn't have those social skills that are so necessary to be able to get along with other students because they haven't had those experiences. And so what they're doing is they're finding ways to make sure they provide those social skills for students. Uh, Jenny's staff is so conscientious and they want to do everything right. And they get frustrated because the students are not on grade level, realizing that it may take some time to fill those gaps. And then the teachers are also, of course, concerned about their health and their welfare. You know, with Omicron being so transferable, they want to just make sure that they're safe for their own families. So teachers are dealing with a lot of challenges nowadays. And it's very heavy because um, none of this is in textbook and maybe it's just starting to deal, dealing with um, pandemic and still doing it, um, still having to deal with it. I'm sure there are things being written, but it's not something that we were 
prepared for at all. So, so that is definitely a lot to deal with. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, can you also share with us um, what it's like to come from a family of educators? I remember you mentioned that as well. Well, I knew I wanted to teach when I was six years old. I used to line my dolls up <laughs> in my bedroom and I taught them for hours. A dad bought me a blackboard. Teachers don't even know what a blackboard is, but he bought me a blackboard and chalk and I would write on the blackboard and I would teach my dolls. I didn't have a single behavior problem. <laughs> but <laughs> I come from a family of educators. I have uncles who were building principals. My sister is a teacher. Uh, she's actually a college professor. She's retired now. I have a niece who is a teacher. Of course, my daughter is a principal. And so we have many, many educators in our family. And so I just kind of grew up with education and knew that I wanted to teach early on and have really not regretted going to college, majoring in education. My master's is in reading, so I've become a reading specialist and I've taught many children to become better readers uh, along the way. But I've loved, as I said earlier, I've loved every single minute of my decision to go into education. And that's so wonderful because I'm sure that um, your your love for education, your passion for education has um, transferred into your children as well. And, and perhaps your grandchildren who you have also told me about, uh, which um, hopefully it does because you, you have such great passion for, for education. Um, so there is a part of the book that states, um, sorry, getting into the book here, um, that states, um, that, um, human, humans require positive interaction with other humans, um, if they are to stay healthy, which is kind of what we uh, talked a little bit about, about, um, what we're dealing with currently with the state of things. Um, how can teachers reach this goal with their students during these times with COVID-19 um, and such still being very present? Well, it's certainly a challenge. We are social beings and we're meant to be in social settings. And that's harder to do when you're dealing with, you know, dealing with a pandemic, but it, it still needs to be done. And if teachers are teaching face-to-face uh, -face with students, then of course you wanna practice the social distancing, but you still need to have those interactions where teachers have a chance to interact with their students at a pretty close level, keeping that six foot distance. And then students have a chance to interact with other students as well, because that's how we develop those social skills that are so necessary for being successful in the world in which we live. Um, and those that we'll need for the rest of our lives. In a virtual setting, it's even more difficult because of course you're not there face to face. And I went through about 16 months of where I was teaching all of my teachers online. And it was just not the same as my as my uh, face to face workshops and seminars. But even in that setting, you have got to greet them when they come online. You've got to let them know they're important. You've got to take an interest in what they're interested in, uh, try to work their interest into the lesson or into the conversation. Make sure you give them many opportunities to talk back to you, to give you feedback so you know whether they're really understanding what it is that you're teaching. So that social interaction is really important, whether you're teaching online or whether you're teaching you know, face to face. That's it's just true. harder. It's just harder with the pandemic. It really is. <laughs> um, now, I kind of get a little ahead here. Um, can you tell us about more about what you currently do as an educational consultant? Yes, yes, I will. Uh, I worked for 30 years with a major school district in Atlanta, Georgia, the DeKalb County School System. And then I retired in 2003. And then my husband and I founded a company called Developing Minds Incorporated. And I was already teaching outside of the district. I would take a vacation day and run and go do a workshop and then be back at work the next day. But it came to the point where I was building up my business. And so we founded a company and I had no idea that things would take off the way they have. I have presented to over half a million educators that will include uh, teachers and counselors and principals. And uh, I've also done a lot of workshops for parents. And I, my goal was to present in all of the 50 states and on uh, six of the seven continents, because I didn't think I wanted to go to Antarctica. But anyway, I am up to 48 states. Yay. Oh my and, uh -huh, and I'm up to five of the six continents. So um, 
I think I was mentioning to you that I'm going to be doing a virtual workshop in Pakistan on on Sunday night. So I'll be doing a keynote at 11 o'clock Sunday p.m. and it will be nine o'clock Monday morning in Pakistan. So uh, I do workshops, I do seminars, I do keynotes at conferences, uh, I work with schools. And my major goal is to help teachers become healthier, but also to teach them how to engage students in ways that will help them remember content and and love school. Because I think really in in many cases, we've lost that passion that perhaps we once had for school. And a lot of students have lost their passion for learning. And I'm trying to put that back into every classroom. And that's so powerful because um, children are very, uh, like they absorb. So if they see someone who they respect, who is their teacher, who probably is, at times, I, I'm speaking on personal uh, note, but also if this does happen, um, at times, some of these students, that teacher is their only good um, role model of an adult. So if we see our teachers happy um, and excited and passionate about education, we're going to be as excited to want to learn. That's true. I, in my workshops, I always say, how can you get a student excited about math if you're not excited about math? (laughs) You know, their passion kind of comes from you. It's kind of contagious. So you've got to really show that excitement to get them wanting to learn more and more from you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So I truly appreciate how you dedicated this book to teachers, administrators, and all educators alike. Um, Is this book meant for only current educators or can it also help like future generations interested in the education field? It's for all levels. And I think it would be wonderful in pre-service programs in college where they use this book to prepare teachers to get into the classroom because it, it tells you what you need to, to do you know, in pre-service. But it's also for those who are just starting their careers. And then it's for those veterans who've been in the business a long time, but who may have lost some of that passion and fire that they you know, may once have had for teaching. And then it's for those who are nearing retirement who may only have a few years left, but wanna make those the best use of their career. So regardless of whether you're just starting or haven't started yet, or whether you're retiring, I think this book is for everyone. There are 12 principles in the book that um, you really should practice. And this is based on not only brain research, but it's based on the medical field, because I've used a lot of references in the book from the Mayo Clinic and from uh, Harvard Public Health and from uh, the CDC and just really reputable resources for these 12 principles. So it's not based on what Marsha Tate says, it's based on what the brain research says and what the medical field says about living longer, looking younger and being healthier. I love that. I love there's like a focus in this book about longevity and I'm like, whoa, this is so important. Um, So you mentioned that you still go into the classrooms to teach aside of everything else that you um, do, which I think is amazing that you still do teach. Um, So which principle uh, from the book do you resort to when you start your day teaching? Well, The first thing I want to do is get my sleep before I go in to teach. And uh, the book mentions that you need about seven to nine hours so that your adult brain is at its best the next day. So I try to get my sleep in. I don't always get it, but more times than not, I do. And then um, I think the principle, one of the principles that I love is optimism. I tend to be a very optimistic person and some people's personalities just predispose them to be more optimistic than others. But when I go in that classroom, I'm always thinking, okay, how can I engage these students in ways that they're gonna love when I'm getting ready to teach? And I think I go in with that passion and that optimism that I want to exude and I want them to leave. And let me tell you how you know you've taught the right lesson. When the period is over and a student says to you, is the period over already? Oh, it's like, <laughs> that's perfect. yeah, it's like, you know, you've taught the right lesson because they don't want you to leave. And mm-hmm. so I, I use the engaging strategies that I teach in some of my other books and that I mention in this book. And um, but the principles that I use would probably be the getting my sleep before I go in, having an optimistic attitude, having a job I'm passionate about. I love my job. And so I think that, it, you know, I exude that passion when I'm teaching a lesson to students and it, it comes across. So 
Absolutely. Um, so then, uh, which principle would you say is the hardest to stick with? And then, how can the action plans le、um, led lead the reader to stay motivated? There are several that, to me, are difficult, and personally, they're difficult for me. One is nutrition. You know, eating the right thing. We've become the fast food generation, and we're so busy. And a lot of times we eat on the run, and we don't necessarily eat foods that are healthy for our brains and for our bodies. And so I think it's hard to stick with, you know, cooking right and eating right.、Um, another one that I think is hard for some people is the movement. Now there are some people who、um, exercise, yoga, you know, that's a part of their their regimen, their daily regimen. But for a lot of people, it's not. And for me, it wasn't.、Um, and so what my other daughter and I. Uh, do a lot now is we take the grandbabies and we walk. She we live near each other, and so we go for those walks. And I just heard a study by、uh, Sanjay Gupta. He he has a book out, and he said that the strenuous exercise is really good for the heart, but the brisk walking is better for the brain. And I didn't know that. <laughs> so I guess we all need to, at the very least, be doing some brisk walking. You know, when、yeah. we're exercising, but I think the nutrition and the movement are hard. But some people, the sleep is hard, especially if they have young children.、Um, and as you get older, it's harder to maintain the amount of sleep. But、um, teenagers actually need more sleep than than adults. So if there、right. are teenagers in your home, yeah, <laughs> do they need to worry about? <laughs> They actually, there's so much going on in that teenage brain that they actually need their sleep as well. So, those are some that I think are kind of hard to to maintain.、Mm -hmm. So, teachers share their energy with their classrooms like all day, as you know.、Um, by the end of the day, they may be so depleted,、um, and that it's so hard to show up for themselves and and for their family sometimes.、Um, so of the principles that you've covered in the book, which should they start with? Well, I really believe, and you're right, it's a balancing act. You know, it's a balancing act. You want, don't want, and I, I must admit that as the mother of three children, working a full-time job, you know, try, as a wife of 42 years trying to do everything that I needed to do when my children were smaller. It was really difficult, and my head is off to teachers who have young children. All my children are grown now, and I am blessed with nine grandchildren. But which is the best part of living, but <laughs> but it is difficult, you know, when you're trying to balance your your workload with your home. I would look and see what things do I absolutely have to do, and what things can I put on the back burner for another time, like. It may be that that house is not as clean as I want that house to be because I need to spend this quality time having dinner with my children. It may be that I want to look at some healthy choices. If you have children that are old enough, I would say middle school teenagers, even even intermediate, then you want to have them help once you get home in the preparing of that meal, setting the table. Um, making sure the dishes are done when the meal is over, so that you're not doing everything by yourself.、Um, you want to. The family needs to know that everybody has a part to share in this.、Um, one teacher、uh, I had when I did the webinar. One teacher said, "Well, I can't get my seven to nine hours of sleep because I have papers to grade." And I thought, "Okay, yes, you do," because she taught English. But what about? With some of those papers, developing some rubrics where you could have students、uh, assessing each other's papers, you know, before they leave your classroom. So you don't have to do every single bit of grading. You know, let your student let your students look for specific things in each other's work with a rubric that they establish. So looking to see if you can get some help. Uh, in the classroom as well as at home, so that you're not feeling put upon and having to feel like. All the chores are yours alone. That's such a great idea. I, I would have not thought about the the rubric. That's such a great idea. Yeah, that is amazing,、yeah. um, especially、uh, because it also provides that、um, cognitive、um, initiative for these wh whatever grade it is. It's still providing them an additional, different、um, outlet for you know using their brain, helping. Yeah, it, it's beneficial to the students. As well, because they get a chance to read each other's work, they know what excellence looks like, they know how to look for those in the work of others. So it's it's really beneficial for the students. 
in accountability too because mm-hmm. if mm-hmm. somebody's if one of my peers who I, I might think is um, I say this as if I'm still in school but if if I was a student um, you know you, you even in college you feel like if somebody else that you admire as a student as a peer is going to read something then you're going to hold yourself accountable to produce better better um, work perhaps yeah self-assessment too ha- having people look at their own work and, you know, grade their own work uh, against a rubric that, of course, the teacher or the students and teacher have developed together. Mm-hmm. So all of, all of that is very important. Um, so the book focuses on improving health and longevity, as we were talking about earlier. Um, is it crucial to be both mentally and physically healthier or can one outweigh the other? Mm-hmm. They're both so important and they both work together. Uh, It's a brain body connection. Uh, One of the things we know is that anything we learn while we're, while the body is moving Mm -hmm. is more likely to be remembered. And that is why people never forget how to drive a car or how to ride a bike or how to tie their shoes or how to play the piano. I had one teacher who told me that her mother has Alzheimer's. Her mother no longer recognizes her, no longer recognizes her grandchildren, but her mother is a pianist. And she said, my mom can still go to the piano and play songs that she once played, even though those other memories have faded. And so it's such a close brain body connection that you can't separate the two. Because when you think about it, you can have the healthiest of bodies. But if that mind is not right, then, you know, there are going to be major problems. And then you could have have a, a very, very sharp mind. But if the body is not as it should be, then you're not feeling your best and you're not going to do your best. So there's definitely, to me, that brain-body connection. And that's why in the book, I have things, principles that are good for the mind and principles that are good for the body as well. Oh, so which one would be your favorite? <laughs> My favorite principle? <laughs> yes, your go-to. Movement. Movement. <laughs> the one that's the one that's like hard dancing? for me <laughs> because whenever I go in a classroom and I get kids up and I say put those book bags down stand up we're gonna learn how to move according to you know when I teach math we teach parallel lines like this and we teach intersecting <laughs> lines like this and I have everybody stand up and some of the kids look at me like you mean you really want us to stand up mm-hmm, I really do want you to stand up <laughs> Nice. But pretty soon they realize that anything they learn while they're moving is going to be long remembered. And so it, it engages them. So that's one of my favorites. Another one of my favorites is music. I cannot live or teach without my music. I have yeah. to. And every one of the chapters in my book starts with a song. And um, when you look at the book, you'll see the songs mentioned. But I'll just mention a few of them for you. For There's a, there's a chapter on Calm Surroundings. Well, the song for that one is John Denver's Any Song You Fill Up My Senses, which is one of my favorite songs because it talks about the world and the earth and everything. And for um, Close Personal Relationships, which is another principle, the song is We Are Family by Sister Sledge. Aww. For our uh, movement, it's I Like the Way You Move by Outcast. So <laughs> every, cha- every chapter has a song that goes along with it because music is so powerful. And I just want to share this with you too, that there are, uh, they're finding now that many of the older patients with dementia or Alzheimer's, um, when they can't remember other things, they can remember the lyrics to, to songs. Oh, and so music has a that. powerful, powerful effect on the brain. Why do you think that is? That's, that's incredible. Yeah, it really is incredible. I think there are more areas of the brain that are affected positively with music um, than would be with just the, the speech. Uh, and I'm not an expert by any means on, on that, but we just do know that people can remember song lyrics when they can't remember anything else. Before my mother passed away, she was in an assisted living home. She lived with me for about 20 years and her last few years when a, a wonderful assisted living place where she could have close personal relationships with other people. And the very things I write about in the book are the things they did to keep her living. And she lived to be 92 years old. And so it, it worked. Mm. But uh, one of the things that they would bring in all the time was the music. And you could just see the older people just, you know, clapping their hands and moving their feet and singing along with the lyrics to the music when some of them couldn't remember other things. Longevity. 
I love that. I love yeah. that word. I, every, I saw it in the book and I'm like, I love this word. This is my word. There's, a, there's another one that's my favorite too. And that's laughter. Laughter. Oh. Yeah, Perfect. we don't do it. We don't do enough laughing. When you're laughing, you're all you're increasing the number of T cells in your body, and you're strengthening your heart. There's so much go- positive going on, and that's why uh, many of your major comedians live to get to be, uh, you know, older. We just lost a, a lady that was near and dear to me, and that's Betty White. You right. know, uh, yeah, she passed away, and she was 18 days shy of her 100th birthday, and so. You know, comedians live a long time. Now, there are exceptions. We have exceptions, but uh, more so than not, you will find comedians. We've lost three recently. We lost Jerry Stiller at the age of 92, George's father on Seinfeld. I love Seinfeld. (laughs) We lost uh, Carl Reiner. Uh, He was 98. And uh, we lost Cloris Leachman, who used to be on the Mary Tyler Moore show. She was 94. So, you know, most comedians live to get to be over the age of of 80 because of the power of laughter and humor on the brain. And and it's also a good, it's a great feeling. Oh, yeah. Right? It's just that it's so rewarding. And and it's rewarding onto whoever is around because it's, it's kind of more like a communal, like, feeling that we're all feeling at the same time. That's it's funny. contagious. Yes. It's contagious. And people don't realize that the brain doesn't know the difference between real laughter and fake laughter. So there are actually uh, laughing clubs, particularly in India, where people are fake laughing and then it gets to be contagious and then they laugh for real and they're finding that their health is being, being improved. That's That should be a thing here in the States. I did not it know. Should <laughs> it should be. I tell teachers they need to have laughing clubs in their grade levels or departments and in yes. school departments in high school and middle school and grade levels in elementary you know have a laughing club and people bring in jokes and riddles I like to bring in riddles because you have to think at high levels to solve a riddle so it causes students to have to think that would so be that such a good idea to actually have just like any other club like chess club or like have a club like that a laughing club mm-hmm. that provides that um the source of like very important because like yeah. I said they're just different different um, lives that some of these students and teachers have um, mm-hmm. to where you know having this sort of outlet is probably one of the most important outlets for a student well, to have. Your get your day off to a positive start. Exactly. Oh yeah. that's so wonderful. Um, so then um, can a book like this be taken to education leadership to start, maybe start or continue the conversation about implementing actions that focus on having healthier, um, happier uh, teachers. What I'm hoping is that schools will use this book in their PLCs, their professional learning communities, and really discuss it. Uh, There are 12 chapters, one for each principal. And so they could take a principal at a time or one or two. And then they can read the book and look at the, what the research is saying about that principle and then maybe get back together and talk about how they apply that principle in their personal lives. And every chapter ends with an action plan. So after they look at the action plan, they can decide which of the action steps they might want to take to um, infuse that particular principle in their personal lives and get back together and talk about it. I think it would be wonderful for the book. And then the classroom examples, because the first part of the book is healthy teachers. The second part of every chapter is happy classrooms. So in every chapter, there's a way to take that same concept and and infuse it into the classroom. And so that, to me, would be a wonderful way for teachers to talk about, well, how are you using laughter in your classroom? Or how are you using movement? What lessons have you incorporated with movement? You know, and that could be discussed in their PLCs. I think it would be a very worthwhile discussion. That would be so great. And yeah. definitely, I can't even imagine the wonderful feedback you would get um, once it is executed. Oh, I'm excited I, to be continued there. Um, <laughs> another thing that, um, it's just the, the whole book is wonderful, but I was very focused on, because I'm huge on purpose, like the purpose of um, just your, of self and then the purpose of self within your career or your career field, career track um, or journey because some some of us might not be exactly where we, we think we should be or are there. So um, tell us more about that, that chapter. Well, one of the principles is purpose. And what you're finding in the research is that oftentimes when people 
retire from a job that they had worked for many, many, many years, and they don't do anything to replace that job, then they may not live very long after that. Or oftentimes you'll find a spiritual connection with couples where they've been married for 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, one will pass away and the other one may pass away soon after because that second one has lost purpose because mm-hmm. the other one's not there. Mm-hmm. And so what I were basically saying in the book is if you lose a purpose, replace it with another purpose. You have to have a reason to get up in the morning, something to do. And when people lose that reason to get up in the morning, it, you know, it can shorten your life. And so uh, the best example I give in the book of that, there are many examples I give in the book, but when you think of former President uh, Bush and Barbara Bush, Barbara Bush passed away in April of 2018 at the age of 92. And I turned to my husband and I said, I hope Georgia will continue to live without her, but it was not to be because he passed away seven months later. And in November at the age of 94, they had been married for 73 years. And that happens a lot with couples who are very devoted to each other. So I encourage people who are telling a lot of times teachers will say, well, I'm getting ready to retire. And I look at them and say, "Okay, retire to do what? In other words, when you retire from education, what's going to be your passion? What are you going to get up and do? You know, what are you going to look forward to doing every single day? And it doesn't have to be anything connected with education, but you need a purpose. You need a reason to get up in the morning on something to do because we're made for that to stay busy our whole lives. And so that's what we want to do. That's so wonderful. Wow. So is there anything else that you would like to um, just leave us with about the book? Well, I, I, I think I'm hoping that everybody will buy the book and read it and, and really take the principles to heart. Because as I stated earlier, they were well-researched. Um, I have the research in there as to why they work for the brain and for the body. And I think it can really, really help not only teachers, but everybody um, to <laughs> to look younger. People tell me, well, you don't look your age. Well, I was born in 1951. So October the 4th, I was 70 years old. And so people say, well, you don't look 70. Well, I practice the principles that are in the book. And so I'm hoping that everybody will take these 12 principles to heart they will find a way in those action plans to adopt one or two things. Don't try to do too much, but just one or two things in the book that that they can infuse into their lives that will make their lives healthier. And then also one or two things that they wanna do in the classroom so that their classroom, their students will be happier. And with their students being happier, of course, they're gonna be happier as well. So my hope is that everybody will get a chance to read the book, and then share the book in their professional learning communities. I just am so excited for people to ha- just experience, because it, it is an experience. It's not just an intellectual book. It is an actual experience to thank read this book. You. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh-huh. Well, Ms. Marcia, thank you so much for such a wonderful conversation about these principles about life um, it, and then also letting us know more about you as well and then the value of incorporating um, these principles in our daily lives. Thank you so much. Thank you. I am just honored to be published by Solution Tree and honored to be a part of this podcast. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. This book is without a doubt another tool for your toolbox with teaching. It's not only motivating, but it guides the reader through 12 principles for self-care and stress management. This book is available on the Solution Tree website, solutiontree.com. Look for Healthy Teachers, Happy Classrooms. Also, to book Dr. Marsha L. Tate for professional development, contact PD at solutiontree.com. At Solution Tree, we share your vision to transform education to ensure learning for all. And we can help you make this vision a reality. No other professional learning company provides our unique blend of research-based, results-driven services that improve learning outcomes for students. We appreciate you tuning in and make sure to navigate to our solutiontree.com slash podcast page to listen to our other episodes. Also, subscribe to our channel today for free on your favorite podcast app. Thank you for joining us.